Thanks for tuning in to our seller interview series. So today we've got an Amazon FBA business for sale in the sports and outdoors niche. Created in August 2014, this business makes $9,265 per month in net profit. And the listing number for this site is 40789. Now, we do these interviews to give potential buyers more information about both the seller and the sites they're looking to purchase. We hope these insights are helpful for you in making a buying decision. Now, we got the seller with us today to go through the business. I cover everything from niche selection to traffic and monetization. Thanks for coming on, Daniel. Not, no problem. Before I dive into the heart of the questions here, just a quick summary for everyone out there listening in from YouTube or on our marketplace listing. This business was built in August 2014, as I mentioned, has a monthly revenue of $39,543 with expenses at $30,278 and a net profit of $9,265. And that is over a six month average. With the sale of the business, the buyer will be given exclusive rights to the brand, five variations of one of their products, brand domain, site content and files, the brand's Facebook accounts, as well as their automated email follow-up provider and all email templates. So Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, What is your background in building and running online businesses? Is this your first one or is this one of several? The history of me, I suppose, is I've always been a salesperson. I've always been someone who is wheeler dealer trying to sell something, whether that was in school. I used to go to the local shop and buy like a 20 pack of cola cans and then sell them from a locker at break time. But online business wise, this was my first one. I mean, I dabbled with eBay when I was a kid, but I think this was the first serious online business. Um, in terms of we started out in August 2014 and we started as a retail arbitrage business. So we bought products, believe it or not, from IKEA and there's a company over here called Boots, um, which sells like cosmetics and beauty products. Um, and we found things that were on special offers and just bought them in bulk and then sold them on Amazon. And we made quite a good living off that, um, myself and my wife. But it was never really going to be scalable. And so we always were thinking about how can we make this opportunity grow into something where it's going to take minimal work, but we can at the same time scale it up. Because at the time, we both had full-time jobs. Sort of came across this private label or fulfillment by Amazon style business and did a course called Amazing Selling Machine, which actually isn't available anymore, but it was a really, really good course. And that basically taught you from step by step exactly how to do this style of business and I've sort of added in my own things along the way just from my own ideas tailoring it for the UK market and so on and um, but in principle that's how we came to it then we selected a, a niche and a product and here we are today. When you did come up with the idea for this business was it based off something you were passionate about or was it something that you researched maybe using like amazing sellers like keyword research or niche research formula that he had in the course? Well, I'm quite a sporty person, um, and so sports and outdoors seemed like the sensible niche to go into. Um, but in terms of the product itself, I'm not a user of it, so it just goes to show you you don't have to be an actual user of the product in order to sell it. You just have to do a little bit of research and find out who that customer is and how you can sell it to their needs. And that's how I chose this particular product in this niche. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, for someone that's brand new to online businesses, maybe they've never heard of Amazon FBA at all, no idea what we're talking about. Could you just briefly explain how this primarily makes money? So basically, the way this makes money is we source the product in China um, at a very low cost, and then we get the product delivered directly into Amazon warehouses in the UK. So the product gets shipped from our supplier in China directly into Amazon. So we never touch the product. So that's, that's a good point. Um, then what happens is the product is for sale on the Amazon marketplace. So when you search for the keywords um, that are associated to our product, then it will come up in the search. We rank number one for this product for pretty much every keyword that we have targeted. Um, good job. <laughs> yeah, and we're number one bestseller in that category for that type of product as well and have been for a good five months now. Um, so we're doing really well with this product. It's well established. Um, but basically what happens is at that point when the customer purchases the product, Amazon then packs it 
prepares it and ships it off to the customer on our behalf and charges us a fee for that. But to be fair, it's a lot less than if we were packing it ourselves, buying the material, paying for a warehouse and so on. So it worked out really well because it's like we source the product, we send it to Amazon and then they do the rest. They even deal with the vast majority of customer service, i.e. returns, um, customer questions about where their order is and things like that. Um, we only deal with customer service in terms of if someone's asking a question about the product or has emailed us instead of Amazon sort of thing. So with, with your product so up there with the keywords and it sounds like it's doing very well, number one for five months, why are you selling the business? Why not keep it and grow it? Uh, as you mentioned, you found something you can scale. So uh, what, what's the reason behind that? Yeah, well, actually, I have already scaled it. Um, when it got to the point where this product was becoming established um, last year, um, I decided that we were going to start another product, but we needed some capital in order to grow the business as quickly as we possibly could because we realized this was a massive opportunity and it was just a case of adding in more and more products. So I approached um, a family friend who has another business and he decided that we could go in it together. So we actually started a completely new fulfillment by Amazon business. And the agreement was that I would spend 100 percent of my time focused on the new business, developing products for that new business. So that business is now approaching 20 products. And um, so that's why I was selling this one, because I'm no longer focused on it. And I want to give someone else the opportunity to really make it flourish and at the same time, raise a bit of capital to put into our new business to expand into off-platform sales on a website, basically. That's fantastic. There's a great reason to redeploy the capital into a bigger opportunity. When you started this business, what was the trajectory of it like? Did you find that once you sourced the product and actually got it up on Amazon, you started making sales right away? Or did it take some time for that to happen? Amazon is one of those places, which I know now from lots of experience in that you can literally put a product on and within hours you can be getting sales um, because their platform has got so much traffic. You're talking millions and millions of people visit their site every single day. And it's one of the only places online that you can put a product on and within minutes even you can be getting a sale because they have a very, very clever ad platform. So in the beginning when you're launching a product, I always put on what's called Amazon Sponsored Products, which is their version of pay-per-click advertising. And what you can do is you can say, selling, for example, a keyboard. So I want to, anytime someone types in keyboard or stainless steel keyboard, for example, um, I want my product to come up. You can then put in a bid and say, I want to pay 30 pence per click. And then a user would find your product, click on the ad. You would pay 30 pence for them clicking. And if they went on to buy, that's a sale. And then what happens is that sale helps you to rank up for that keyword. So if you are then targeting a stainless steel keyboard, then what happens is you get that sale, it starts to bump you up and give you a bit of rank juice. So the more and more sales you can get, the higher up the list you're going to appear organically until you get to the point where when someone types in stainless steel keyboard, your product comes up first and then you can turn your sponsored products off and now you're not paying for clicks, now you're just getting the sales. That's and that can, that can happen really, really quickly. My latest product that's launched Within two weeks, we were number one, just because I know exactly how to do it now. And um, the product that we're selling, that one took a little bit longer, just because at the time, I wasn't really familiar with how to do things like this. But I can give all that information to the buyer as to how it's best to launch a new product, because it, it is like a little gold mine, this, this opportunity. So. <laughs> Uh, is there anything you learned from this business you're going to be applying, and maybe you already are, applying to your this bigger opportunity that you're working on? Is there any like core lessons that just worked really well for you? Maybe, maybe this Amazon advertising at the start of launch, but is there anything else? Yeah. I mean, I think the real nuggets, so to speak, are selecting the right product is the main part. It's making sure that you select a product that is high volume, high sales, and that's has got competition, but just not too much competition, but then making that product better than what everyone else has made it. So if you take the example of a stainless steel keyboard again, if everyone else has just got a standard one, but you put something extra on it, I don't know, like it comes with a, a number keypad or something like that, just a differentiator so that you don't just have to be another stainless steel keyboard and compete on price. I think if you make your product better than what everyone else is offering, then you can not only get a higher price, but when you get to the top, 
it means that people aren't comparing you directly to your competitors because you get an extra, like a mouse or something like that comes with it. Um, and then the next thing is having the absolute perfect listen. It's making sure that your sales copy is right in with the customer needs and writing it benefit driven. So not just saying this keyboard has buttons and this keyboard is doing sales. <laughs> it's making it to the benefit of the customer. It's like, putting the picture in their mind that on your desk, this luxury stainless steel keyboard is going to look the bee's knees and you want to be taking them to the point where they've already bought it. And then the product images backs that up. You should be having your product images and your description should be interlinked. So it's almost like you're telling them a story. And that's exactly what over the last 12, 18 months of doing this product that's for sale, that's what I've learned is that the listing and the pictures and the actual product itself is key. Um, everything else can just fall into place. Ranking will happen as long as you've got a good product with a good description and good pictures and you know what you're doing with sponsored ads. I think those are all great points, especially the part where you were talking about creating an actually better product instead of just you know, copying a product that you see that has good opportunity in terms of competition and ranking-wise. I think that if you really focus on quality, it's the best shortcut to success because you know, people want quality. So I think those are all fantastic points for sure. Now, on the flip side, what have you tried that didn't work? Is there anything that just kind of failed flat on its face for you here? Well, I mean, in the beginning, I think one of the main mistakes we made was that we were trying to do everything on a budget. So we took the pictures ourselves of the product with our iPhone, um, and we put them on a nice white background ourselves. And we wrote a lot of the sales copy without really focusing on what the customer avatar was and having an idea of who our ideal customer was. It was like we're trying to sell to everyone instead of just picking a particular person and really talking to them as part of the sales copy. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes we made is because that's why it took longer to, to rank this product because it wasn't appealing. It was like you were trying to sell product X to every single person out there saying it was good for this and it was good for that and it was good for this and, and these people will get benefit from it and these people will get benefit from it. But really what you should do is pick one particular person and sell it to them and then it's going to really resonate with them and then they are going to be much more likely to convert and the conversion is king in terms of Amazon ranking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, speaking of traffic, moving from rankings into traffic, uh, are you getting all your traffic to your Amazon listing specifically from Amazon Organic Search? Or are you still doing those paid ads or are you doing no. any kind of other traffic? We ran the paid ads for maybe three months and then we turned them off. And since then, it's been completely organic. Um, so we have no sponsored products in the UK at all. And this is just one product, right? Or It is one product with five color variations, yes. So we started with one color variation, and then we started to expand it by adding a few more colors and realized that we could actually do a lot better. Even when we just went from one to two colors, it was almost like instead of the decision being buy the product or don't buy the product, it was buy the product in this color or buy the product in that color. (laughs) It was like like giving people an opportunity, an option close almost like when you're selling in a phone shop, for example. Um, Then we added more and more variations and eventually settled on five colors. Um, So, yes, one product, five colors. How stable are the earnings? Do you find that there's any seasonality in this product at all, or is it pretty stable throughout the year? It's not really a traditional seasonal product. It's not something that gets like a massive boost at Christmas. I mean, everything gets a boost at Christmas. You're talking probably one and a half to two times the sales in December. But it's not something that is typically bought as a, well, it swings and roundabouts really. It is, it could be a gift, but it's more than likely a product that would be bought for oneself. Um, in terms of seasonality throughout the rest of the year, I think in summer we do see a bit of a peak just because it's sports and outdoors and people tend to be a bit more sporty in the summer. But it's not like huge fluctuations all year. Um, in terms of, reaching sort of the lifestyle of the life cycle of the product and all that i think now in november and december we've sort of reached the capacity of where we can take the sales to in the uk in terms of we're number one for all of the keywords we're number one bestseller in this category all of the competition are starting to fall behind us just because we're getting more and more reviews we're like over a thousand reviews now and um, the the product is doing exceptionally well so i think 
the life cycle of the UK is probably reaching its peak. However, that is literally just the opening of the door for Amazon. Amazon US is like five times the size. Um, we haven't gone over there yet just because we're based in the UK and it's a bit of a, a fear factor, so to speak. Um, but with my other business, we have expanded into places like Germany, France, Italy and Spain simply because the stock is all coming from the same place anyway. So you ship it into Amazon UK and then you click a button and Amazon will ship it out to 27 European countries and sell it on their five European marketplaces. So oh, wow. there's an opportunity there for the buyer to take this business that's doing very well in the UK and if they're confident in America, go into America with this. And if they want to um, expand the European marketplaces, that opportunity is there as well. We were in the process of thinking about doing it. So all the listings have been professionally translated by translator.net, which provides translation services. Um, so all the listings are there and active. And the product is actually for sale in those four other marketplaces. But we just haven't done any real work on PPC or sponsored products or like optimizing of the keywords or anything like that. So we may be seeing five or six sales per day just by chance organically. But so there's definitely an opportunity for that to grow. If I understand this correct, the UK warehouse, the fulfillment warehouse you're currently using, it's basically one click to use the same exact warehouse that will then go out to the rest of those European countries you mentioned earlier? Yeah, exactly. So basically, uh, there's super convenient. <laughs> two sides to it. So you've got the European Fulfillment Network, where you click one button and say, I'm happy to send my products to 27 countries without throughout the EU. And then what happens is, if a customer buys it on Amazon.co.uk, which is the UK site, but is from Luxembourg, for example, then Amazon will just ship it to Luxembourg. They'll charge you exactly the same fee. So you don't get paid, you don't get charged anymore. So you make exactly the same margin and the customer gets it delivered and pays an extra delivery charge to their country. And you can do where you list on the other four Amazon marketplaces. So you can list on Amazon France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, with Germany and France being the two bigger players in that sort of thing. Um, typically on my other business, we see if a product is selling 100 per day in the UK, you'll probably get 40 per day in Germany, 20 per day in France, and then 10 per day in Italy and Spain. So you're talking about almost doubling your sales um, just by expanding into those marketplaces. Some preference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you reach or you, you think you're reaching kind of towards the peak of the life cycle of your product in the UK market. Could you just kind of explain what you mean by that? What do you mean by the life cycle? What is the life cycle of the product? So I think the life cycle in my mind is when I picked a product that had longevity. Um, I didn't want a product that was um, seasonal. I didn't want a product that was just in trend. Um, like something like a hoverboard, for example. I didn't want anything like that, where it was like, here a day, gone next year. I wanted something where it was like, set it up, get it work, going well, and then set and forget. Um, and so that's why we picked this product. And I think that the life cycle of this one is sort of reached where the sales, I don't see them increasing much more in the UK because we're already ranked extremely highly. We're taking a huge chunk of the sales of this type of product every day um, in terms of between the competition that's out there. And I think that it's sort of hovering around the same amount of sales per day now. We've played around a little bit with pricing to see if we can increase the margin, and we've been doing a bit of split testing on that. So again, all those results the buyer can have. Um, but what we found is there's a particular price that works well. It gives us a particular volume. It makes like reordering the stock very, very easy. Um, so I think the growth opportunity for this business is expanded into other marketplaces like the US and the other European countries or adding more products. Um, there's a lot of products. The good thing about Amazon is when someone buys a product underneath it, it says customers who bought this also bought this. And so now that this product has been established for well over a year, there's a lot of solid product opportunities just in that itself. So you can have a look at those and say, actually, we could sell one of these as well. And then it's directly linked to your product. And then customers might buy that at the same time. So I think there's an opportunity for that to sort of expand and take on similar products or products that are related. But at the same time, in my other business, we don't really think like that. We just take a product that is doing well, make a better version of it and rinse and repeat. So it might be that they're all in sports and outdoors, but they're not necessarily all linked. We do get a bit of cross-selling just because of the brand, but 
that's not really the focus. It's just find a product that works, make it better, and crack on, and then do it again. Now, speaking of opportunities, what do you think is the, like, let's pretend you're going to keep the business and you're going to keep growing. What would be the least risky path that you would focus on to grow this business? Expand into Europe. I think the listings are already there. The translations are done. Um, everything's active. Um, it's literally just a case of turning on the PPC, the sponsored products, and just targeting the right keywords. So you might reach out to a couple of people on Fiverr.com and just get some German speakers, French speakers, Italian speakers, and Spanish speakers and just say, if you were searching for this product, what sort of keywords would you use? And then let them be your keywords that you target for PPC and then see the natural sales come after that. That's a good strategy. Yeah. So you said you already have the listing, the product listings already translated into these different languages? Yeah, so they're already active. So they've been translated oh, wow. and I've uploaded them to Amazon. So they are actually active, um, I think, two months ago maybe. So the product listings are there. And as I say, we do get a couple of organic sales per day, like five or six sales per day, mostly from Germany. Um, and I think that the opportunity for someone to grow that is phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what would you do on the flip side if you were incredibly risky, you just threw caution to the wind, and you wanted to grow this business as quickly as possible? I would probably do what I'm doing now in terms of my other one, where it's add more and more products, just continue to add more and more products. Um, the return on investment in terms of adding in extra products and following the same model is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's finding the right product, adding that into the range, making it the best it can be, and then launching it, waiting two weeks for it to be successful, taking it over under that time, and then just repeating and repeating and repeating. The only downside to that is obviously it's a bit more time consuming than literally clicking the button and turning on the European <laughs> sales. <laughs> um, so it really depends on the type of buyer. I think if you've got a buyer that literally just wants to have a passive income whereby they can literally just purchase this and then be almost guaranteed an income for the vast foreseeable future, then option A, take what you've got, consider doing expansion into Europe or just crack on and get $10,000 a month in revenue in their profit. Um, or option B, you've got someone who is willing to spend four or five hours per week in doing some product research, talking to some new suppliers and opening some new supply channels, getting the product listings written by either a copywriter or doing it themselves, and then just continuing to list more and more products. Um, four to five hours a week, man. That sounds, that sounds pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of hard work there, yeah. No, I think you've got to remember is there's a, there's a time difference in China. Well, from the UK, there's a big difference. I think in the US, it's obviously quite as big as well. Um, so when you are looking for a new product and then you reach out to a supplier, it's not like you can do loads of work that day. You can maybe send out an email, which is the same, to 10 suppliers, and then you wait until the next day for a reply. So I think True enough per week. Is, I'm not blowing out the water there. I think it is achievable. You, you could do that. Um, I, even on the other business where we've got 20 products, I'm doing maybe two hours a day in terms of actual ticking it over and looking for new products. I mean, I do sit at my desk a lot longer than that, but that's just because I like experimental growth. So at the moment, we're looking at like a website and things like that, and I'm playing around with that. Um, and I've never done that before, so everything takes a lot longer. Uh, absolutely it's man it's literally just this business and you're wanting to add more and more products I think two hours a day would be more than enough that's fantastic that's one of the things that's so cool about these businesses is like, if you want it in maintenance mode it like it doesn't really take that much longer than just you know making sure you have supplies right making sure that's going good and any yeah. customer service things or something like that but uh to wrap up the risk section here what, what do you think the biggest risk for this business that buyers should be aware of Anything that stands out? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest risk for this business, as with any other product business, is your competition, is the people who are doing similar things to what you are doing, um, who are creating equally good products with equally good listings and equally good photos um, and doing exactly what you're doing. There's always going to be those people. But what I have found in my experience with Amazon is that 95% of the sellers are extremely lazy and they literally do not want to spend any time in making the perfect listing or spending that little bit extra money on making the product 50% better while only spending an extra 20 cents. Um, whereas you, the buyer, or I, will always do that. I think that what you've got to remember with this one is that it's number one in the category and has been for four to five months. Um, you've got, we do have competitors there. I would say we've got 
two main competitors and then the rest are very small players. Um, but those main competitors just have not got as good descriptions and are really grasping at straws to make their products a success. The product that we have is better than theirs and every aspect of our listing, pictures, bullet points, description is better. And then we deliver an amazing customer service as well. So, And whilst on that, I think in terms of your working time and customer service, I think this business is 15 to 20 minutes per day customer service, but that can be outsourced. At the moment, my wife does that for us. But in my other business, we have a virtual assistant in the Philippines and we pay her $300 per month and she does 40 hours, no, 20 hours per week for us. So, and that's just because we've got lots of products. So for this, you could outsource the customer service and get rid of that headache. And then that's it. It's literally order this product once a month and you're done. You kind of cover the maintenance there. Yeah. Is there any skills or requirements that you would recommend for someone to have before they purchase this business? Absolutely not. Um, I think that what I've learned from this is that outsourcing is king. <laughs> you can literally <laughs> outsource anything and they can often do a much better job at it than what you've had. So our photographs are done by a photographer and um, a professional product photographer, which we've got the contact details for him. Um, the listing is one of the only things that I actually write myself because I did a lot of research into NLP and sort of understanding the customer mindset and how to um, write good sales copy. But again, that type of thing can be outsourced. So in terms of skills that you need, the ability to communicate with a, a supplier in, in China, which is done in English over email, which is a pretty basic skill, and the ability to do a bank transfer once a month where you send the money to the supplier, and that is really it. There's nothing more complicated to it. Um, if you want to expand and look at further products, then you need to have a bit of common sense about what products will work and what products won't work. But again, I've got a pretty good criteria that I go by that I can pass on to the buyer as well because there's plenty well, of products out there. Moving to some of the wrap-up questions here, would you be willing to sign a non-compete? It sounds like you probably would be, but you know, just saying to the buyer, hey, look, I'm not going to go start the same exact product after you buy this business for me. Yeah, exactly. I would be, I'm would be. i more than happy to sign a non-compete. I mean, as you know, I also have another FBA business. It is in the sports and outdoors niche, but not in the same category and I would be more than happy to sign a non-disclaimer for this product. Obviously, I can't sign a non-disclaimer for all products in sports and outdoors or a general non-compete for Amazon because I have a much bigger business than Sorry, I have. Of course, that would so I don't think much I sense. Myself in the foot for two hundred <laughs> grand. So I think, um, I'm more than happy to sign a non-compete based on this product. Um, any other product would be open space. And how much support would you be willing, willing to offer the new owner? I think when I answered this for the listing, I think I said six hours of uh, Skype calls um, where we can do something like this over Skype and just have a chat and go through anything that the buyers can be questions on, screen grabs or whatever, um, and then 60 days of email support. So if they've got any questions, then just send me a screenshot and I can get back to them. As I said, I'm at my desk uh, Monday, Friday, most weeks, so I can always get back to them pretty sharpish. It's not going to be just a sell it and forget because, like I say, one of the main reasons I'm selling this is because I want it to flourish. I want it to do the best it can. I feel like it's because it's the first product we launch, I'm almost a bit like attached to it, and I want to make sure that it is 100% successful. So I don't just want to hand it to someone and then watch it disappear. I want to make sure that I hand it to them in the best possible light and that they have a massive opportunity to grow it. And then I can always think, I start that. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, obviously, the best case scenario here for you and for Empire Flippers is someone comes in and buys it for full list price. But are you at all open to a splitter or now say someone gives you, uh, hey, 80, here's 80% up front and I'll give you the remaining 20% after the training window is closed or some other kind of earn out scenario like that? I mean, to be honest, Gregory, I think that because the idea of this is to sell it and then use the capital to invest in my other business and um, where we've got lots of product opportunities waiting to be launched, I think that in an ideal world, I would like 100% upfront front um, a split offer. I don't know. It would have to be um, a very high percentage of front and then 
a very short period of time that the buyer pays the rest in. I mean, in an ideal world, it's going to be 100%, but if it was 80-20 within a month, then yeah. But to be honest, I think at 80-20 within a month, you may as well just pay it all up front anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think yeah. at the end of the day, the, the buyer is getting a pretty good product for a pretty good price, um, and it's just going to be pay it and then reap the rewards every month after that. So... So before I ask you my final question here, Dan, just to give a quick summary again of the business for everyone out there listening in, this business was built in August 2014, uh, monthly revenue of $39,543, expenses of $30,278, with a total net profit of $9,265, and that is over a six-month average. With the sale of the business, the buyer will be given exclusive rights to the brand, five variations of their main product with their brand domain, site content and files, um, also their brand Facebook account and automated email follow-up provider account and all of their email templates. So Dan, my final question for you is, what is your best pitch in 30 seconds or less on why someone should purchase this business? Next question, put me on the spot. <laughs> it's, the hot, it's the hot seat question. <laughs> yeah, I'm <love> a pitch. <laughs> well, yeah, I think, as I said, it's a best-selling, well-established product with excellent longevity and um, very little work to maintain, even less with a VA, like I said. Um, an excellent opportunity to scale, either by just going into those European markets we talked about or by adding more and more products. It literally is a, a plug-and-play business, and it's going to be a regular monthly income with a tiny amount of work and a tiny investment at the price I'm asking as well. <laughs> Excellent. So for those out there watching this on YouTube and you want more information, the link will be below the video that will take you to the marketplace listing. Now, if you're watching this on the actual listing page and you're wanting more information, you can become a depositor today. It's super easy. All you do is click the button, make a deposit and you'll be given everything you need to review this business. So thank you, Dan, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time, Greg.